And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us straight from Rookie Jet Studio, and the and the man who is who previously has overarms under his, under his belt, now coming to us with Red Giant, a cursed world, which we will be getting into late late as we go in tonight, the one and only Corey Burns, thank you, not thank to be you. confused with Mr. Burns. <laughs> not to be confused. I've heard that too many times. Yeah I, yeah, I figured so I'd get I figured I'd get that one out of my system. I'm pretty sure I used that last time too. You you might have. I don't know. I hear I hear it pretty frequently. Enough but, to make yeah. a drinking game out of it? No. <laughs> I require too many drinks for that. Yeah, and I, I... One, I don't want you to call, cause a liquor shortage in the state of Ohio. And two, um... I wouldn't want, any, I wouldn't want anybody on the show to die of alcohol poisoning. Right. Yeah, well, thanks for having me back, man. <laughs> thanks. Thank you for coming back. Um, it's been, it's been a hot minute since you've been in the temple, so how have you been, have you been holding up in the interim? Oh God, busy! You know, it's been a turbulent past two years, and oh, I've I've stayed busy. <laughs> I don't know what else to to say in that regard. I mean, we've pumped out a lot of stuff for Overarms. We've been working on several other games, Red Giant included. Uh, I believe you had me on for Gimmick Zero as well. Yes, and we did. Yes, I did. So, so there's been quite a lot going on. Been staying busy, and I'm hoping to take a break someday. <laughs> <laughs> someday um, soon yeah the, the problem the problem is people the problem is people say that but then the itch comes yeah i mean you're not you're definitely not wrong when it comes to that i mean i'm i'm in the in the boat where i finish one project and i've already got you know another one halfway finished and then i want to finish that one um and it's a it's a cycle it's a vicious cycle that and repeats itself even if even if you t even if you took a few days off for to, you'd end up you'd you'd end up walking around and then seeing something and that would and that would spark an idea that would stick in your head. Yeah, you're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it ta it takes one to know one is all I'm is all I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's pretty much how it works. You pretty much nailed it. So. Now, red red giant was this was this something that you ended up c conceiving while you were while you were working on um overarms especially since the two of them have some very similar dna going around i think i think red giant probably has the most interesting origin story of anything i've worked on because it's actually older than overarms um so red giant started off as an osr project that i wanted to make um while I was working on the uh, Ryutama expansion, uh, mm -hmm. Nico Goblin Field Notes Guides. And that, that, like I said, started off as an OSR project, and I did release it. Personally, I, you know, looking back now, I don't think it was good by any stretch. And so uh, I went ahead, and after Over Arms came out, and it was successful, and everything, you know, panned out in my favor... Um, I wanted to revisit Red Giant because I, I really loved the idea of the game and I, 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 you know, had spent so much time on it, but I wasn't satisfied personally with what I had done for the project. So after Over Arms was completed, I went back and decided to take another shot at Red Giant. And now here it is today. It's, I think, in a much better place and it's way more interesting than it was originally. Mm -hmm. Although... I know you. I know you said it started as an OSR. Would I, would would it be fair of me to take that to mean that in its early days it was using the kind of system that you would the kind of setup you would see in a lot of um, a lot of throwback a lot of throwback OSR games like Swords and Wizardry. Um, so I mean, if I it, to be completely honest, it, it was pretty much a nave hack. If you're familiar with that game, yes. Um, so I mean, a lot of it was based off of what Nave did. And it just expanded on it. So, I mean, that's that's pretty much. If you're looking for the original, you know, idea of Red Giant, look no further than Nave. Mm -hmm. And with 
But um, was it was it a case where you ended up writing yourself into a corner because obviously, the red giant that 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 I have in front of me does doesn't have a whole lot of DNA doesn't have a whole lot of DNA to be considered a knave hack. Oh right, yeah. I mean, I don't think I wrote myself into a corner with the original or the new one by any stretch, but it was more so the idea that, um. <clears throat> You know, I was looking for, instead of creating a system, I was looking to use something that was pre-existing. And mm -hmm. overall, just the, the work I had put in on it originally just wasn't up to my speed. It wasn't, it wasn't quality, in my opinion. And when I got the chance to revisit it, I was, st you know, it, it had a lot of flavor to it. It had a lot of, a lot of roots, but it, you know, the plant wasn't growing. So... Mm -hmm that's when you know you bust out the water bucket you start watering the plant right but sometimes you have to repop the plant too so that's where i took it from an osr system and you know kind of put it back into the overarm system i had created mm -hmm. but i had twisted and changed things enough to where it feels unique it feels fresh and it doesn't mimic the style of play that overarms tries to bend to mm -hmm. now You've you state you stated that this is inspired by Berserk, Claymore, and Vampire Hunter D. Amongst and, other greats, yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um but I do want I do want to focus on those three primarily because one of them ever a lot of people have brought up, especially especially with the advent of um of these Vihander people trying trying to do their own crack with blackbirds, which um kind of iffy on if I'm being honest. Um but but with the with those three I'd 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 like to get into what what um what was what what grabbed you with with each of those entries and what you ch and how you tried to carry that into um Red Giant. Yeah, I mean um I mean all of them take place in a world that you know if if you were to be uh you know tossed into any anime world, I don't think any of us would pick up either three of those right no it wouldn't um, make for a good isekai no 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 uh so i mean i can think of probably like 50 others uh off the top of my head i'd rather enter than than berserk vampire hunter d or claymore and so i wanted to write something unique i mean a lot of people will compare red giant to mork borg um and they'll compare it to other games of that nature um, but I wanted, you know, the same thing with Overarms. I wanted to write something that was true to the anime where you could make these kinds of characters in the game and that also just separated itself from the pack, right? And so I think, I think originally, I don't know how old Morkborg is actually, but I, I know it's somewhat fresh. Um, I think I might have wrote the original Red Giant before Morkborg, but I'm not here to, you know, act like I'm... <laughs> I'm the originator of this kind of thing, but it's, it's, I think one of the things that just really pulled me in was just the idea that, you know, in all of these, in all of these kinds of anime with, you know, Vampire Hunter D and Claymore especially, uh, there's no saving this world. There's no fixing it. They, they, the people in these worlds are on a quest that's personal to them mm -hmm. or that they may have gotten sucked into somehow. And, you know, that's the kind of stories I want to tell. I like the idea that you cannot save the world and that you have to kind of make your own meaning um, in this, you know, hellscape. And so I think that with the, the stories that Claymore, Vampire Hunter D, and Berserk told all together, it just really resonated with me in terms of, you know, not being that stereotypical you know, even in anime and even in tabletop RPGs where you're saving the world or you are just some, you know, amazing person who exists in the world and there's no one like you. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, it's, you're, you're, a, you're a person, you have armor, you have your weapons, you may have a power or two, but that doesn't mean that you won't be powerless in this world, right? So I think that's what really grabbed me about these kinds of media. And mm -hmm. I think that's what I try to pull into Red Giant as a whole. Um, incidentally, Vampire Hunter D is is um is something of a is something of a deep cut involved in with it within all of these. 
Um, right. How did you first get introduced to that? Was it from the first movie or from, from the second movie or from the um, light novels? So definitely light novels. Um, I was a terrible student <laughs> when I was younger. And so I was very tardy and they made me go to night school. And they didn't really care what you did in night school. So I would just read the entire time. And I had picked up uh, Vampire Hunter D from Borders books, which mm. I don't believe any exists any longer. No, unfortunately. Right. Yeah, I mean, there was nothing better than getting a coffee and sitting at Borders and just going through their library, essentially. But yeah, I mean, I'd just sit there and read. And, you know, being in high school... Well, yeah, being in high school... Um, you know, I, I was obsessed with all of the dark, grungy stuff that I could get my hands on. And mm -hmm. so Vampire Hunter D was a perfect fit. Anime, dark, edgy, horror, you know, throw it all at me. So mm -hmm. that that was definitely my first introduction to Vampire Hunter D. And, of course, knowing um, the artist behind it with Final Fantasy VII, all the Final Fantasy games as well with the concept art and everything, it was just a perfect fit. Mm-hmm. Um, when it comes to, now, when it comes to, incident, incidentally, when it comes to the two movies, which I wish there had, I wish there had been more movies, but that's just me, um, Bloodlust is the superior one, I, I will die on that hill. <laughs> you know, I mean, I actually haven't seen any of the movies. <laughs> um, the, fir the, um, the first movie... Which is just Vampire Hunter D is is loosely based off of the first book. Okay. Um, it's very much of its time. Very, very. Er it was very, er very early '80s, and that means you've still you still see a lot of Nagai imitations. Okay. Whereas Bloodlust was do was done by the same guy who. Who's responsible for Ninja Scroll? Oh, right on. Okay. And is an adaptation of the third book, although the third, although it's not as bleak. There were a lot of there's a lot of changes between the book and the and the film. But it but it's far but Bloodlust is far better to look at. Yeah, I can I can see that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I think I've caught clips of the movies in the past, um, but you know, there I feel like there's kind of like a prejudice you have when you you uh, maybe that's not the correct word, but when you watch something or you read something in the format that it is like I know people who have you know they read Lord of the Rings, they don't want to watch it, vice versa, and I feel like Vampire Hunter D, you know, while I would absolutely watch them. I think I'm going to enjoy them more as books. And also, I'm just terrible when it comes to actually sitting down and watching things. I mean, I'm, I'm probably one of the worst people I know because I get asked all the time by people, have you seen this? Have you seen that? I actually just did a stream the other day where, you know, I was talking about Red Giant and just games in general, and we just ended up on the topic of anime because there was like five people watching. And so we watched a bunch of trailers for anime together that everyone was interested in, and my my list expands it's like a cbs receipt so i mean it's it's far too much for me to to catch up on right now mm -hmm. uh that's that's the reason that is the reason that a that and that that uh, my anime list exists so that so that people can can um sh can shame themselves with their giant backlogs Right, yeah, no, I mean, it's 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 really criminal how much I haven't watched. <laughs> I mean, if I, like I said, I want to take a break. Maybe one day I'll catch up. <laughs> one day, one day, is that, is that like, is that like how, the, is that like how I keep getting, I got, um, I got turned away from the 1997 Procrastinators Convention last week. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> they told they told me to come back tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it sounds like you attended the convention, then, in my opinion. Um. Well, yeah, yeah, but yeah, but you you miss her. You didn't hear the full thing. The 1997 Procrastinators Convention last week. 
Ah, okay. Yeah, I definitely didn't catch that. Yeah. Damn headphones. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> now, yeah. with the... With that with that said, no, when when it comes to when it comes to things like cl things like Claymore and Berserk, I can definitely see that DNA, um, especially with this whole idea of a wor a world a world that is that is that is afflicted with ju with just this wasteland of mo of monsters and worse. Uh, but I get the feeling that you that even in the full book, you're not going to put a whole lot of focus on trying to on trying to build. The a world a world map or some gazetteer or, or something like that. Much like a, given the OSR DNA, you want each table's world to be unique. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's you know a pretty pretty good uh, way to look at things, and mm -hmm. I think that's kind of the philosophy that I I have behind making my games. Usually, is that you know every time I play the tabletop RPG. And I, I don't, I don't, can't remember a single one that, it, you know, sticks to the book 100%. Everybody has some form of homebrew in their game, whether it's, you know, we're just going to ignore equipment, or we're just going to ignore weight, or we're going to, uh, you know, you have a, a magic bag of holding, um, or, you know, we're going to change this about the story, etc. I mean, somebody's going to change something, so... When it comes to world building, and I think I think tabletop RPGs are the perfect avenue for world building, and it allows people to create experiences at the table they want to tell, not necessarily that they want to retell, right? And I mean, there's there's definitely going to be some things that are adverse to that with setting books from you know Wizards of the Coast and quite a few other RPGs as well, but for the most part, I think. With my games, they come off more as toolkits than purely a full game. And so <clears throat> I try not to spend a lot of my time, you know, trying to ruminate on what this could be and how perfect it could be. I just want to, you know, provide people with the tools they need to create their own cursed world. Uh, in Red Giant, it does have a, you know, proper setting. And you can absolutely feel free to play that. But I've already had people even asking me in my Discord server, uh, you know, it, can, can we play Red Giant if we insert it into a different setting? And the answer is yes. I mean, it was made that way. So I, I totally understand why people would want to do that and why they would want to use this game as that kind of framework for that. Mm -hmm. Now, with that in, with that in mind... Um, one per one particular at one particular avenue that I did find interesting in regards to character creation is the is the fact that you kind you kind of have a bit of a um, archetype system, which Overarms certainly did have that, but not to this degree. Right. Right. Like, yeah. I mean. The, so the archetypes, a lot of the archetype and character creation as a whole, and I'm not going to even pretend like this is my idea. Mm -hmm. um, this is, a lot of it is lifted from Ryutama. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I know I've mentioned that probably with every single game I've spoke about on here. Yeah. Uh, and games that I've created. You didn't, so you didn't mention it with Gimmick Zero. So you've got, so you got that going for you. Right on. Uh, but yeah, so I mean, it, that's, that's, that whole idea is completely lifted from Ryutama. Um, I, you know, like I've said, I love that game to death. I think it does so many things really well. And kind of when I went into creating the uh, Red Giant we know now, uh, I, I really wanted to just kind of make it the antithesis to Ryutama, right? Because Ryutama is a, like, what do they call it? Miyazaki's Orphan Trail? And that's that's what I I don't know if I don't know if anybody else called it, but that's what I called it when I reviewed it. <laughs> that's it. Literally says that on the back of the book. Well, bully so, on I me mean, then. It's a, it's a, so it's a really good you know explanation of what you're getting into when you play the game. Mm -hmm. And so I mean Miyazaki, you know, is usually very upbeat and uh, fantastical, and I kind of wanted to take the inverse of that. 
and also apply it with some of these Ryutama mechanics. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm not saying it's a Ryutama hack or anything like that. It definitely stands on its own, but I wanted to see how the world of Ryutama might look in a sense if you made it this cursed world instead of a fantastical one. Mm -hmm. And with the that bring that brings me to to the obviously the other half of it is the um is the exchanges which I'd say the exchange I'd say the exchanges is where is the exchanges and the um and the ar and the archetype I mentioned beforehand um I'd say would I'd say would be akin to akin akin to archetype and class and, and a lot of other ones since the since the exchanges really are really where you're going to get the unique things you can do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, exchanges, um, I've heard a lot of people, and I, I never thought that the exchanges would really be this popular amongst people. Um, but I guess this is kind of where overarms bleeds through a little bit as well. Um, because, and when you have overarms, you want to create a power for your character, but you don't want to just be like, yep, I can stop time. Uh, you know, there needs to be some sort of monkey paw effect to it, right? Um, where it's like, okay, well, you can stop time, but it's only for, you know, two seconds. So you have some sort of negative that always weighs against your character, kind of like a balance scale to, you know, quite literally balance your character, right? And so Red Giant kind of does the same thing when it comes to this using the exchanges. I just didn't know they'd be that popular. Mm -hmm. Um, I well to be to be fair, you did kind of open yourself up to it with that line with that line in the quick start about encouraging people to come up with their own exchanges. Oh, absolutely! I I like I said bef like before when I said you know people are always going to homebrew their game to some extent. I want to encourage people to make content for these games. I want people to you know feel free to come up with something at the table. I don't want pe people to you know be confined to a 120 page book mm. i don't want people to feel like they are constrained you know i mean after years of playing vengeance and dragons if i cast magic missile one more time i'm gonna rip my damn hair out so um you know i want to be able to homebrew things i want to be able to um allow people to do the same Oh, believe me i got i got into many arguments about uh, with uh, i've gotten into many arguments with with homebrewers and GMs alike, when it comes to the ungodly amount of spell lists that casters have, while while anyone who isn't a caster is ju is just a spare prick at a wedding. Right, 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 and I think that's also very present in Ryutama. Um, and in Ryutama, I believe, if I'm remembering right, because with COVID and everything, I haven't been really playing games a whole lot. I played some online, but it's definitely been curbed a bit for me. Um, especially with working, you know, two full-time jobs, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, I, I think in Ryutama, you get a basic spell list that people can cast from. Um, but then, if you are a magic caster, I mean, good God, you have, like, four different, like, not physical books, but in the game they're called books, but they're mm -hmm. several pages uh, labeled by seasons that you can cast from, on top of being able to cast from the same... Um, you know, list of spells as normal people. Yeah, I, so, I did bring I did bring that up when I covered it that there is a bit of there is a bit of the um that I sus I suspected that Ryutama was in its early in its early days was a, a was an A D and D hack because of the because of the whole because of all the stuff that casters can do beside right. compared to people who aren't casters. Yeah. I I, I would agree with that. For the most part, I think that, you know, I, I don't know that I, I'm completely forgetting the author's name and I feel horrible over that, but I, I feel like, you know, this Ritama was a work that was in the shop for a very long time. I, I, I know that he owns his own shop mm -hmm. and his own tabletop RPG shop that he sells tabletop games at, um, and I believe that's changed names over the past couple of years, but... I, you know, it's probably something that he's kept under wraps for a long time, um, and then 
played with people at the shop and ordered ballots and things like that. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, when you're when you when you're a spellcaster in a game like that, it's not inherently broken because it's not like you're casting wild damage mm -hmm. as a spellcaster in Ryutama. Most of it is very uh, removed from combat. And so it does have it's a balance in that regard. But, you know, you don't want to be a farmer and not be able to cast magic at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, but within, but within, within the, di within the um, different, different exchanges, which, right. what, um, would it be correct of, of me to assume that, er that, er that early on you had it as just one exchange, but decided to change it to one to three after some testing yeah yeah i think that's a fair assessment um yeah i mean it, it essentially became a thing where it was like well i want characters to feel well let me let me kind of backtrack here because i think with red giant i i didn't have a leveling system initially and so one exchange with no leveling system is more like a one-shot system, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, at least when it was in the early days of Red Giant. Um, before, you know, after OSR, kind of the middle ground of its life right now. And so it made sense to only just have one. But then once you level up and you're playing in campaigns, you know, you don't want to be limited to just one exchange. You want to be able to actually, like, have these opportunities to pick up new exchanges and to, uh, you know, maybe the storyline has driven you somewhere where there is a, an altar where you're able to sacrifice your hand and, you know, gain something, some sort mm -hmm. of power uh, in exchange for that from some sort of deity from this cursed world. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted characters to be able to grow more. And I wanted them to be able to, you know, I wanted players to be able to have fun with it as well. Um, because, and I don't think I've mentioned this anywhere, but actually uh, there are some exchanges in the book that if you, and I'm not for it, I don't suggest doing it, but there are some exchanges in the book that you can take on the same character and you will 100% be a power gamer. <laughs> so they kind of work in tandem in a sense. So definitely... Uh, you know, you can take it that way if that's the kind of game that your table wants to run. You can, uh, you know, not do that if you want a more narrative experience. Or maybe sometimes it just ties into the narrative experience. It's completely up to you. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes... Now, one per one particular thing that's, that, uh, is hint that is hinted at in the quick start, but, but is, but is gray-boxed that I did want to touch on is survival. Because um, when it comes to survival mechanics, it's very easy to have that get a little bit um, fiddly. Mm -hmm. um, early yeah. early D&D uh, and, and, and stuff like Torchbearer can kind of lean into this, which is why I like how games like Five Torches Deep try to, um, try to streamline it. But yeah, what? so I mean, just to touch on survival for a moment, um, because that's that's another thing I have yet to really talk about in the open. Survival isn't something where it's like very co hard coded into the game of you have to do it this way, you have to do this, etc. Um, the game has a lot of stuff that's been kind of grayed out, and I apologize for the way that that quick start was made. I've heard a lot of complaints about complaints about how. Uh, that was done but we were working so fast we didn't have any oppor we didn't have any opportunity to go back and restructure everything specifically for the quick start mm -hmm. so I, I totally get that it's a little bit sloppy anyways so there's a few systems in the game that are completely optional and survival is one of those um so survival the hex crawl map creation um there's a calendar system as well that mm -hmm. i don't believe is detailed in the quick start could be wrong. It's been a minute since I've looked at it. Um, and so there's there's quite a few things that are optional in the game as well. So you can, you know, maybe you like the calendar system, you don't like survival, you don't like hexes, you don't have to use those. But survival as its own is essentially you need to sleep, you need to have rations, and you need to have water. And, you know, you can track that as you need, and 
that's going to be pretty much the extent of what survival means. Mm -hmm. Um, But, as you know, and maybe other people don't, um, there's a sanity system in the game as well. And so if you go days without eating or days without drinking, it can not only affect your health, but your sanity as well. So it ties into that as well. Mm -hmm. And when it comes... Now, when it comes to when it comes when it comes to san- when it comes to sanity, obviously, th- obviously, um, a lot of a lot of people will be familiar with the concept of sand checks and the like. But do you ha- but um, do you have it where where je- where um, where encountering mo- encountering monsters frequently is go- is going to be draining sanity, or is it is it a case where the where monsters that actually that actually have an effect on sanity are not are not every monster so the way that the sanity system works mm-hmm. in red giant is that anytime you encounter a monster and it could be you know the same monster you know say you're traveling through a forest you encounter three of these monsters mm-hmm. each time you encounter them you will make a sanity check and so you make a sanity check against their sanity target number, and it, let's say the the monster's sanity is twelve, uh, your total sanity is ten, but when you make your sanity check, you roll a nine. That means you would deduct three sanity from your total. So from ten, you would now be at seven sanity. And sanity can be recovered through sleeping, you know, actually getting a good night's rest. Uh, if your character's religious and praying at altars or something like that, you can also gain uh, sanity back from that. There are exchanges that tie into it as well. Mm. Um, but the short version is essentially that any time you run into a monster, you are going to make a sanity check. Mm-hmm. Now, when... Now, um... When it com- when it comes to the when it comes to the use of um of spirit, um, right is 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 spirit largely going to be used for magic or are there going to be other uses for spirit? So it's definitely going to be used for magic. Um, I'd love to see if some people could come up with other uses for it. Mm-hmm. Um, so spirit. Uh, Spirit ties into the three different schools of magic in the game. Um, I believe there's only one or two in the quick start. Um, But the three schools of magic in the game are speech, orb, and staff magic. Mm -hmm. And all of these work in different ways. And this is another thing that's kind of inspired by Ryutama. I'm sorry, Mm -hmm. I I love to gush about that game. Uh, But, so, speech magic is probably the most unique and that was the only school of magic in the original osr version where you get a effect you get these keywords that tie into effect uh radius and power and so you could have something that's i mean if it it's sort of similar like (laughs) this is probably like the worst thing the worst reference i could use but are you familiar with dot hack yes Okay. I am very familiar with dot .hack. Right on. So you know how the gate, the gates work in that, where you have the keywords that all tie in, like mystical, green, forest? Mm-hmm. So it kind of works in the same way, where you can have, uh, you know, like, pillar, flame, uh, you know, what would be one? Pillar, flame, um, I'm trying to remember what I wrote. <laughs> Pillar flame, and then whatever keyword would you know go towards the actual power of of that, and mm-hmm. so the power. Let's work backwards. So the power just determines how much more damage it does. Uh, it's kind of like a bonus modifier. So you don't exactly need that all the time. So you could still just have pillar flame or pillar fire, mm-hmm. and you'd create a pillar of fire that comes out of the ground, um, or wherever you're casting it, and so. Then you have the pillar, which is a vertical kind of thing, and then you have the flame. So you have all of those combined to make a spell. And then moving on from speech, you also have orbs, which are one-time use items. They're kind of similar to uh, Materia from Final Fantasy, um, except they are one-time use instead of being used constantly. I guess they'd be more akin to Final Fantasy VIII's magic system. 
Um, and then you have staves, which staves can be used multiple times, um, but I, I believe are not as combat oriented. They're more meant for use in the wild and trying to help you with your journey mm -hmm. or things like that. Yeah. In other in other words, in other words, it's a it's a big stick you probably don't want to break. No, yeah, you definitely don't want to break them. <laughs> Especially since the the vibe that I'm the vibe that I'm getting is that with e is that with each of these um Unless you're unless you're playing the sorcerer archetype, you're not gonna be you're not gonna be starting out with and with any magic. You're gonna have to find it. I mean, it just depends on how you want to run your games. In all honesty, I mean, if you want to pick something like the vagabond, and you still want to start with magic, there's nothing saying that you can't do that in the game. It's just gonna be up to your GM's discretion. Mm -hmm. um, is it meant to be that way? Not exactly, but. You know, at the end of the day, it's all about just enjoying the game and not worrying about things like that. Mm -hmm. So to anybody who wants to play the game that way, I'd say go for it. Um, but there are definitely certain archetypes and certain exchanges that gear you more towards magic than others. Mm -hmm. I would say, though, that everything about Red Giant has something to do with magic, though, right? I mean, yep. you have these creatures coming up out of the ground due to this sun that has expanded and the light has placed a curse upon the planet mm -hmm. and awakened these long lost horrors and there's just everything reeks magic everything has the magic stink right so i mean it's it's not exclusive to certain archetypes um every exchange is pretty damn magical in my opinion so you know, play it how you want to play it, and yeah, just have fun. <laughs> yeah. Now, to be fair, to be fair, you did put the calendar in the quick start, but it, but um, there wasn't really any connective tissue as far as far as what that calendar would actually do. Okay. And while I could I could see it ha I could see it having some having some degree of having some degree of effect be. Because even with that, even with the sun being bigger and redder, um, the Earth is still on an axis, and seasons do still exist. Which right. is which, yeah. And well, we brought up Ryutama a bunch of times, and and seasons were a big damn deal in Ryutama. Absolutely. So I think it's I think it's fair to have one, to have one have um have, have one connect to the other. Right. I mean, it, it's it's kind of one of those things where I, I believe, I'm not sure how much of the calendar is covered in the quick start. It might be the full system. It might not. Um, but in, in Red Giant, there's supposed to be four months, essentially, um, very similar to a lot of games like Harvest Moon, things like that. So you have your spring, summer, fall, winter. Um, and it's also supposed to speed things up. So the calendar system kind of produces a way for you to place events um, as a GM and kind of surprise your players and also keep track of events that are happening so that you're not, you know, how many days have passed? Have, how, how many times have you guys slept so far? You know, et cetera. You just bust out a calendar, you use the system that's in place and that it helps you keep track of what's going on if mm -hmm. you're playing a very uh, lengthy or uh, journey-focused kind of game. Yeah. Now... When it comes to the bestiary, I obviously I've seen that there's that there's quite a that there's quite a bit of um, mo of monsters in there. Right. Um. With each of th in the full book, with each of the ones that that are going to be present, do you have do you plan on having each on each of them have a bit of a um, art representation? So, <laughs> art in tabletop RPGs is very expensive. Mm -hmm. Um, there is definitely art representations of some, but not all. Um, it, you know, I, we, we did have an issue, because the, the person who did the, the artwork for Red Giant is also the person who did the artwork for Overarms. Mm -hmm. uh, same guy, great guy, Juan Yi. Um, you know, love working with him, but he had some life stuff come up, and mm -hmm. unfortunately we weren't able to get the uh, full set of art that we wanted 
and we didn't want to, you know, hand that job to somebody else and have two different kinds of art in the book. And I think it kind of did Red Giant a favor in a sense, at least with the bestiary, because a lot of this kind of stuff is very powerful when you're imagining it. Mm -hmm. And with the whole, you know, uh, Lovecraftian kind of creatures that sometimes exist in, in this book, um, you know, do you want to see that drawn out or do you want to imagine that and try to explain that to uh, your players or have them create their own idea in their mm -hmm. head of what this kind of being looks like? So I think for some of them, you know, you're going to see some artwork and it's really great, but for a lot of them, I think there's going to be um, a little bit left to the imagination and I don't think that's a bad thing. Yeah. Truth be truth be told, I don't really get a Lovecraft vibe from Red Giant. the vi The vibe that I get the vibe that I get more of is a Wayne is Wayne Barlow's Hell. Sure, yeah. I I, I didn't mean the entire book as its own. Yeah. But there are some creatures in there that, uh, at least in the full book, not. I tried to keep things in the Quick Start World book a little more tame. Mm -hmm. Um. But there are definitely some things in there that are reminiscent of Lovecraftian creatures. Not yeah. Cthulhu, but you know, um, things in that vein. Something, something like the sh something like Shubnagrath, probably. Uh, you'll find out in the full book. <laughs> <laughs> um, something else I could I couldn't help but chuckle at is the is the use of the use of quotes for chapters. Yeah. Which is, it's a vi it's a very world of darkness thing to do. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Um, what, as well as well as as well as the way the page layout give, gives a very si gives a very silent film vibe. Was was that intentional or, or was or did it just happen to hap happen that way? I think that probably. I mean, I'm glad it gives you that kind of impression. Actually, that's that's very cool. Um. It all kinds of it, it all kind of ties back to when I was in um, that night class uh, mm -hmm. for school, where I was reading a lot of you know like manga. I was reading a lot of uh, philosophy, uh, you know, Kierkegaard, uh, Nietzsche, um, a lot of just existentialist kind of stuff at that time. Mm -hmm. And after looking at Red Giant, I uh, you know the OSR version that I had created. I think that it just kind of clicked that it's like, you know, this ties in perfectly into a cursed world, right? Mm -hmm. Where you are trying to make your own reason for living instead of succumbing to the horrors around you. That's like a pretty much uh, a fair play on how we all live our lives, right? Where you can simply give up and quit doing what you're doing and, you know, the, you can imagine the rest, but... Instead, you keep pushing on, you keep struggling, right? And so it's very existential uh, influence in the book. And I think that it, it really, that and the cursed world concept hug each other very nicely. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that it's just, it's just a match made in heaven or yeah. hell, depending on how you want to look at it. <laughs> um, would, it be fair, would it be fair as, as well to, to say that that concept of the cursed world isn't too far removed from the wasteland concept that's uh, that's often seen in westerns or western adjacents like Trigun. Yeah, I mean, to some extent, with Trigun, um, with Trigun, you you have civilizations that do carry on normally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they have power, they have medicine, they have things of that sort. The world of Red Giant is lends itself more to a world filled with disease, uh, mysticism, um, you know. It is that same core wasteland style. I see where you're getting at with it, but it is definitely, you know, there's no electricity, um, at least in my version of Red Giant. Um, everything is very medieval-esque. I, um, I, suppose, I suppose another example I could use is... Kashern Sins. Not familiar, actually. I uh, would say a good a good description for it. I think mm -hmm. everybody's probably seen it at this point. 
would be if you watch the Castlevania Netflix series. Mm-hmm. Very reminiscent of that kind of world. I can I can go I can go with that even though there is te- there is technically a fair, there is technically a fair amount of technology in inside inside a lot of the a lot of the um vampire areas. Um yeah, I I mean that's that's fair. Not hey, there's nothing saying you can't do that in your game of Red Giant. <laughs> but if we're talking about, you know, people living and trying to survive, you know, that's that's the kind of vibe you're yeah. going to um, come across in Red Giant. I'd also br- I'd also bring up did I'd also bring up um the Genesis Rebirth. The Genesis Rebirth. That was I, that was the. That you was know the, so many things that I don't. <laughs> <laughs> That's. I real. I realize this quote. I realize this quote is a bit is a bit cliche, but I. I see. It seems to describe my. Li- it seems to describe my life. That's what I do. I drink and I know things. Right on. <laughs> um, but the Genesis was that RPG by um, Six More Vodka. Um. Yeah, it's see you throw out a lot of things, and I know the name, mm-hmm. and I can think of like the cover art, but I I'm <laughs> when it comes to the content, I'm like, yeah, I'm just too busy. <laughs> well, Same thing with movies and stuff, you know. And that's nothing against you; that's totally on me for not keeping up with the gist. Culture. With the gist with the Genesis is a is it is a, it is a post apocalypse though hedr- though hundreds of years after the meteor dropped in this case, which. Mm. Created a which um carried with it a substance called burn that mutated some people into becoming, a, into becoming a completely new um spe- a new species known as well Homo degenesis. I am right on. I am ve- uh, and that particular new species is significantly more powerful and has ver and has some very weird, um types of abilities. And some and just some weird mutations. The point is, is that it is very easy to tell when someone's a degenesis because there's no way they could pass for human. <laughs> yeah, I'd say that's a pretty good way to know. Oh, it w- it mainly got its reputation mainly got a, a repu- the reputation it had due to the um due to the art that it presented. Mm-hmm. Um, but when it comes when it- when it comes to this this particular sandbox idea of um, red Gi- red giant, have you have you given any consideration about putting some about putting some sort of loot table in the GM section? I I think that's 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 a good point. Um, yeah, I mean, I I've, I've thought about it before. Mm-hmm. But it's kind of one of those things that I, 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 I do genuinely hate about RPGs is that if you kill a spider, you know, why why the hell is it dropping coins? Why is it dropping, you know, armor or, you know, some some rare drop or just just something like that? I mean, have, have you ever smashed a spider IRL um, or, you know, seen like a bear carrying a sack of coins, right? I think Life so, of the Party I mean, made fun of that. Yeah, I mean it's 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 a goofy thing, and I get why it's there. I mm-hmm. totally get why it's there and why why people do it, but I feel like it also adds to the helplessness that you'll find in the game. I mean, if if a GM wants to have someone slay a giant skeleton, and they find some medicine that it was carrying, God bless, uh, you know, knock yourselves out with it. But as far as that kind of flavor into the game, no. I mean, pretty much things are... Everything is a very rare resource just about in Red Giant, Mm -hmm. and I want that to be conveyed through the game. So you're going to find things in civilization. It might not be what you need, uh, but you might find it. You could find things in the wild, but like like I said, you're not going to kill a giant spider and find a sack of coins. And to be fair, that wasn't... That wasn't where I, that wasn't where I was shooting at with the suggestion. I was thinking of some, of so, of something to of something in reflect to um, to kind to kind of pa- to kind of pair off with the ma- with the map creation system that you have. Mm-hmm. Um. So it's they'd be less about getting rewards from ki- from killing a spider and more about getting rewards from exploring a region. Um, oh, okay. I mean, yeah, I I. 
just just on face value, you know, with no time to sit and think about that idea, I don't see a purpose for it just because it's it's that that's a very video gamey thing, I think. Mm-hmm. Because it, even if you do explore an area, there's no, you know, what are you, what are you, who, how are you finding that? Are you just yeah. finding it from picking it up off the ground? Is it, you know, kind of an achievement kind of thing? What is it? Because, I mean, it, th- then I think that's one of the things that the game can do really well, is that if you want to do that, like, if you were to run Red Giant and you said, you know, I, I really like the idea of having, you know, everybody get a reward or the party gets a reward for exploring this hex mm-hmm. or exploring this area, um, maybe even as a side kind of thing. Um, you can do that. There's nothing stopping you from it. It's not something that I've personally added into the game simply because I don't think it ties directly into the ethos of the game. Yeah. And to be fair, when it comes... When it- the other th- the other thing I had considered, and I will I will admit I'm blatantly stealing this idea from Scion, is a trophy system. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's that's definitely something I would leave out. Uh, there's no rewards in in the cursed world. The reward yeah. is staying alive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, I can I can get I can get that. It's ju- it's just something I thought I I thought I'd um throw in there. Oh, by, by, like, but let me echo the same thing. If that's something you would want to add into your own game, there's nothing in the game that says you can't do that. You're not going to break the game by doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I really, really want to encourage people, yourself too, um, to just genuinely try the game and add in what you like. Remove things that you don't like. Mm-hmm. It's It's a game for... Just about everyone, I think. It's just you have to cater the experience to yourself and the kind of players you want to attract. Mm-hmm. Um. Now, with with that with that in mind, um, what are you shooting for as far as the total page count? So, I mean, the way that I do these games is that the the book is done. Um, I actually have the final book sitting next to me. Um. But, so the final page count is, I believe it's 120. Let me double check. It is 100, and, yeah, I think it's 120. Um, and that could be wrong. I actually have the beta version that's missing a couple pages that we forgot to add. So, um, but yeah, I mean, essentially, let, and let me explain that a little bit, because I did the same thing with overarms. Mm-hmm. Is that you're you're essentially you know, I I do these by print on demand, right? So mm-hmm. you're not making. You're not the goal set on Kickstarter isn't going to, um, you know, determine if the book gets printed or not. The book's done. That the goal is whatever I put into the game before the Kickstarter happens. So when the Kickstarter goes live, all of this, all of these funds that are coming go towards future content they go towards you know making sure that um we 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 support the game going forward Mm -hmm. and so that we can actually feed ourselves for working on a game for three years in such a niche hobby and so it's it's kind of a backwards way of doing things on kickstarter but i'm also I like to have things completed ahead of time. I don't Mm -hmm. like to, you know, have empty promises because we don't know what tomorrow's going to bring, right? Mm -hmm. I don't want to promise people that I'm going to make this game and I'm going to need $50,000 to make it and, you know, three years later, you know, people aren't happy with the game because they've also had the weight on top of spending their money. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure it works for... It it clearly works for people, but I, I like to go this route and use Kickstarter more as like a sales platform mm-hmm. than to use it in terms of we, you know, absolutely need you to give us money um, or the game's never going to come out. Because mm-hmm. by the time I launch Kickstarter, at least currently, and this may change going forward, I'm sure I'll try some different things, um, you know, the game's complete. The game's essentially complete. We might be proofing it, we might be, you know, waiting on something to come into the mail. 
Um, but the game is complete. It's been tested, etc. So, I mean, mm-hmm. all of that is completely done. Yeah. And with that, with that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as a release window? So, uh, the release window, currently I have it listed on Kickstarter as February 2022. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to release it sooner. So, I mean... This could be, you know, any time between December and February. So that's that's what I'm aiming for currently. And like I mentioned before, life can happen, right? That could always change things. It could come out sooner. It could come out later. It depends on what's going on. I do know that the uh, files and everything are ready to go. Um, you know, I, I can hit a switch and drive through RPG right now and launch the game. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't want to, you know, do that obviously while I'm running a Kickstarter for the game. Mm-hmm. Um, but it also lets me know how how interested people are in the game. You know, if if we get, you know, a handful of backers and we don't get nearly as much money as we wanted, um, you know, it, that doesn't really tell a lot about the longevity of the game that we're making, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but if we, you know, exceed our expectations tremendously and, you know, we get a bunch of funding, yeah, absolutely. Let's, let's keep making that kind of content. Let's really knock it out of the park. So, I mean, right now, uh, eight, actually today I released a free scenario to backers called Unbroken Wings. Um, and that's compatible with the quick start so that people who are excited about Red Giant can get with their group, you know, this weekend or whenever they're free and play a scenario that is exclusive to backers right now. So I, I think that, you know, I'm, I'm really surprised with how much funding we've got so far. I mean, we're sitting at over 20,000 right now and I'd like to see that number go up and I'm not a fan of stretch goals myself, but mm-hmm. I would love to, uh, you know, create more bonus content if we continue to exceed these expectations. Now, with now and and uh, with that, with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. Um, oh, absolutely! <laughs> and anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often thank say you. around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Oh, absolutely! And of course, been... oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, it's been a pleasure. I mean, mm-hmm. thank you for having me back on. It's mm-hmm. always a good time talking to you. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the Internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay Fucking frosty, everybody!